about 10 years, ago, no, gosh, it must've been about eight, nine years ago, when I was going through really hard times, man, I've read Thomas Talbot's book, and that was just like the sweetest medicine for my soul. And then I found this other book um, that was called The Evangelical, and that was, that was my word, I'm that, I'm that, Universalist. And I'm like, what the heck? Uh, and, and, I did, and universalist was a weird word, because I go, well, that, what does that mean? Some people think it means Jesus doesn't matter. Other people think it means he's the only thing that matters. And uh, those two words, e- evangelical is a confusing word, because that's good news. And s- some people seem to think it meant scary news or something. But put those two words together, evangelical. I was fascinated by that, and I read that book. And, and I, I thought, well, I'll never meet Thomas Talbot. He's too cool. And then I read uh, the Evangelical Universe. I thought, this guy's great, Gregory McDonald, but who the heck is that? And then I found out he's not even a real person. I'm never going to meet him. But I'm so excited that the real Gregory McDonald is here with us tonight, Robin Perry. And uh, <laughs> Robin just finished working on a, on a new book published by Zondervan on four views of hell. So I, I read... Actually, I read your parts, Robin, but I didn't read the other parts yet. Because um, Robin shared last summer at the Rethinking Hell conference at, at Fuller, and it was just, it was brilliant, and it was great to get to know Robin a little bit. So we're super grateful for Robin. Um, do you, do, can we pray for you? Beth, this, would that be okay? All right. Yeah, you come up here. That'd be great. Jesus, I just thank you for Robin. I thank you for his heart. And uh, we thank you that Robin, uh, Robin's heart is a place you dwell. So flow from Robin's heart into our hearts. And may our, you flow back to Robin and encourage him. And you, would you be glorified in all of it, Lord Jesus? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Is that a yes? Yes. <laughs> So I bring greetings from England. The uh, queen asked me to send her greetings. <clears throat> she says, all is forgiven, you can come back anytime. <laughs> and if you are looking for an alternative candidate for president, she's willing to consider it. <laughs> um, I'd like to introduce you to Richard. <laughs> Richard is my cuddly lizard. Um, my, young, my eldest daughter insists that I take Richard where I, wherever I go and get pictures of him. And my youngest daughter, Jessica, so that's Hannah, Jessica insists that I had to bring it up to introduce to you. <laughs> that sounds kind of cute until you find out that they're 21 and 19 years old. But <laughs> <clears throat> so I have now named them and shamed them. It would be fair to say that those of us who believe that God's love will save all people are deeply committed to the importance of God's love. It's because God loves that he will work salvation for all people. Of course, belief that God loves all people isn't the preserve of universalists. It doesn't entail universal salvation, so Arminians and open theists are also committed to the universal love of God. They just deny that God's love will achieve its goals in the case of some people, or perhaps many people. Some, they claim, will resist God's loving offer of salvation forever. And I don't really want to engage with that view in this talk, although I may say a few things about it. My focus is going to be on the claim that God loves all people with a saving love. This belief, I maintain, is biblically grounded theologically important, and something that we shouldn't shrink from in embarrassment. Now, why, you may think, would anyone be inclined to shrink in embarrassment from claims of God's universal love? Surely the overflowing love of God is the most sublime of themes, something to shout from the rooftops. Here is one, a quote from one of my favorite Puritans, Peter Sterry. Our God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the God of love in the truest, the sweetest, and best sense. 
He alone is love itself, an infinite love, a sweet and clear sea which swallows up all bounds, all shore and bottoms into itself. However, the fact is that those of us who seek to ground God's universal salvation in God's love for all have come in for some criticism for doing so. And this criticism tends to take one of two forms. The first form, which I will imaginatively call objection one, is that we universalists have not taken our understanding of God's love from scripture, but have instead picked up on sentimental, romantic, and worldly understandings of love, and then we've imported those into our theology. So, it is said, sure, your view of love sounds very plausible to people who aren't immersed in the Bible like we are. However, you're coming to the Bible's claims about God's love already assuming that you know what love has to look like. Sorry, I need to... There we go. (laughs) Richard, forgive me for I don't know what I'm doing. But what you are doing, they say, is imposing your sentimental views of love onto God, whose love is not like worldly love. So what we need to do, it is said, is to allow the Bible to show us what God's love is like, because God gets to define himself, and he doesn't have to submit to our standards. What we need is revelation. That's the objection. So what I hope to show today is that such accusations are right and wrong. They are right to say that we need to understand God's love in the light of God's self-revelation. They are wrong to suggest that universalists don't at least attempt to do this. The second form of the objection, objection two, is a related concern. It goes like this. In the Bible, God is loving, sure, but he is also holy, just, full of wrath at sinners, And so in one recent debate on hell, it was suggested that God's love so dominates my thinking that I haven't got any room left for these other ideas. And the suggestion then is that universalism offers a myopic vision of God. We're told that instead of this, we need to affirm both sides, God is love and wrath. In this talk, I hope to show that this accusation misses the mark because universalists do take into account God's holiness, justice, and even wrath. Furthermore, I think it's the critics who need to be very careful, lest they end up creating inner tensions within God that war against each other, threatening the divine unity. We'll come back to that. So what I want to do is to sketch God's self-revelation in Scripture, and most especially in the Gospel. What does the Gospel show about the love of God? What is it like, and to whom is it directed? My hope is that we can see that God's love manifest in creation in the story of Israel, in the story of Jesus, uh, will give us a biblically grounded view of what God's love looks like. So I'm going to tell you the story of the whole Bible in terms of love. Uh, And I believe that in fact it's the critics of the universal understanding of God's love who fall short, both biblically and theologically, of a satisfactory understanding of the love of God. So, all talk about God including talk about his love and his wrath, is anthropomorphic and anthropopathic. That is to say, we're using human language with all of its limitations to try to understand something true of the infinite God, the creator of all that is. So we speak of God in terms of human emotions, and we need to acknowledge up front that we do not know, we cannot know what it is like for God to be God. God is a mystery. He dwells in light, inaccessible, hid from our eyes. All our talk of God is fragile and limited and open to misunderstanding. We only see in a glass darkly, but we do see something. We do see something true. So we mustn't give up speaking of God. Instead, we need to speak with care. God's love is not simply like human love but bigger, like some kind of supersized version of a cheeseburger. It is a love divine, all loves excelling. But neither is divine love something utterly unlike and unconnected with human love. After all, humans are created in the image of God. And if if it were the case that God's love was utterly different, we might as well give up speaking about God at all and go home now. 
So instead, we submit ourselves to God's self-revelation and tread carefully. If you don't think I tread carefully enough, let me know later. If you wish to glimpse something of God's love, then study God's works as works of love. Here is Peter Sterry again from the 17th century. Study the work of God as it is a work of love. That love is the band of perfection. It is love then which runs through the whole work of God, which frames, informs, unites it all into one masterpiece of divine love. In England, we have this candy stick called Blackpool Rock. You can see it there. It's like a long tube of candy with the words Blackpool Rock printed all the way through it. Blackpool is a holiday resort, by the way. And wherever you snap the candy bar, you get the words Blackpool Rock. And it's the same about like that, it's a bit like that, with God's action in creation. Wherever you look at it, you can see God's love stamped through it. So what we're gonna do is break the story at different places to get a better shape of sense of what God's love looks like. Does that make sense? Wave your hands when it doesn't make sense, okay? I'll assume it does if you say nothing. I wanna begin with something that theologically we really only come to grasp at the end, but for reasons that should be clear, I plan to start with it. The tradition claims that God is love in his essence, a claim that has, as we'll see later, solid biblical roots. Now for God to be love, there has to be an object of love. It would be unintelligible to claim that God is love, but that he loves nothing or no one. But if love has an object, does this mean that God has to create a universe in order to be love? in order to be God. Because after all, if God is love, then mustn't God have someone to love? And the tradition has answered with a no, and has rejected the claim that God needs to create the universe in order to be God. How can this be? Because God is both the subject and the object of divine love. God is the one who loves, and God is the one who is loved. God loves God's self. As such, God loves even if there is no creation for God to love. Now, of course, you might now be thinking, well, hold on, doesn't that sound a bit selfish and self-obsessed, which is kind of the opposite of love. So the key thing to remember here is that in the Christian view, God is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God in three persons. So the beloved within God is always the divine other. The Father loves the Son and the Spirit. The Son loves the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit loves the Father and the Son. Each of the persons ever pouring himself out to the others in an eternal act of self-giving love. I say himself in scare marks because obviously none of the persons of the Trinity are male. Uh, Although, of course, the son was incarnate as a human male, the logos is not masculine. Obviously, it's a word, it's a Greek word, but anyway, shut up. (laughs) (laughs) We do not know what it looks like for, what this looks like for God. We we do not know what the inner mysterious life of God is like, but we do have this tiny, fuzzy glimpse But the mystery of inner divine love is the foundation and root of all love in creation. So I want to talk about creation. You can see where I'm going because it's all up there, right? So God doesn't need to create the world in order to be love. As such, the act of creation is a free act for God. It is also an act of love because the cosmos is a gift of love. In the first instance, it's an overflow of the inner triune love of God. Creation is an expression of the Father's love for the Son and the Son's love for the Father in the Spirit. I'm hoping Baxter's going to be okay with all this because he's the Trinity guy. The Father made all things through the Son and for the Son. So creation is, first of all, the Father's gift of love for the eternal Son. Here's Colossians 1. For by him, that is Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. So the Father creates all things through the Son and for the Son. 
And creation is joyfully received by the Son as a loving gift from his Father. And then he perfects creation in himself and presents it back to the Father. So creation is in the second instance the Son's gift of love for the Father. Here's Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. For Christ must reign until he, that is the Father, has put all his enemies under his feet. When all things have been subjected to him, the Son, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, the Father, that God may be all in all. So here, when creation is finally subjected to the Son, the, the Son is himself subjected to the Father on behalf of the creation he represents, offering creation back to the Father so that God may be all in all. And obviously, it goes without saying, because Ilaria said it for me, but um, this is not a forced subjection here. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to imagine the son being forced to submit and subjected to the father. This is just nonsense. It's what we in England call bonkers. <laughs> so creation exists by virtue of and within the inner triune flow of love between the persons, and it will reach its destiny within God's triune love. Creation emerges from love and it exists in love, it is upheld by love, it exists for love, it's drawn towards its destination by love. So Christianity makes love, in fancy terms, the ontological bedrock of reality. You can't go under it, you can't get deeper or go around it. There is nothing more fundamental about reality than love. When I say that creation exists within the love of God, I obviously don't mean that creation is a part of God or creation is God or anything like that. Creation lives and moves and has its being in God. And here, really, we can only speak in metaphors and gesture towards mystery. So creation may not be required for God to be God, but we still describe it as fitting for the God who is love. It seems to make a kind of sense for God to create a cosmos, at least in the light of the glimpses that, of God that we get as God reveals himself. So the world itself is an object of divine love in that it was given out of divine love for the divine other and is received as a gift of love from the divine other. Much as, you know, when my kids were little and they used to draw me cute pictures and they give it you, you know, if my, if my daughter had given me a picture, this little scribbling she'd done and hands it over, and if I rip it up and throw it in the bin, I'm not just rejecting the picture, I'm rejecting the giver. And it would, I, would, I would never do that, of course, like that. But it's the same with, with God. God's not going to reject the gift of creation that is given, that is granted within the Trinity. And so by loving creation, the Father and the Son love each other. And in the same way for them to reject creation would be the rejection of a gift of love offered from the other, which would be a form of divine self-hatred, which, needless to say, is theologically unthinkable. So while it is true that God does not need to create the world in order to be loved, I think I've made that point, <laughs> nevertheless, it doesn't follow that if God does create, God can choose not to love the world, as if loving or not loving the world is some arbitrary choice for God. We'll come back to that. The biblical foundations for some of these claims will also be made clearer when we, when we come back to look at the gospel, because it's in the supreme revelation of God in Christ that we see that God is triune and we start to get a better understanding of the Trinity. We only really understand creation when we see Christ. As T.S. Eliot observes, we shall not cease from exploration and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. So I'm begging a little bit of patience for now. What I want you to take away for the moment is simply this, that the act of creation, both originating and completing it, is an act of love of the Father and the Son for each other. A further point that is worth making before we move on from creation concerns the creation of humanity. The scripture says that humans are created in the image of God. And in the ancient world, the image of a God was a cult statue, what we call an idol. 
Now, the idea in ancient pagan religions around Israel of, a, of a, an idol was not that the idol was the god in any simplistic way. They were more, the pagans were more sophisticated than that. Um, the idea was that the spirit of the god would inhabit any idol that had been consecrated to the god, and then the idol would basically function as the god. So the, the presence and activity of the god would be mediated through the idol and any idols that have been consecrated to that god. Now, um, the god of scripture forbids the creation of idols and cult statues. And the reason for that is no unthinking, unspeaking, unhearing, inert piece of wood or stone can represent the living God. But God has authorized his own image or icon, or if you want to be provocative, idol, namely humanity. We are the icons of God, which means that humans have a very high calling. We are called to image God in creation, to be filled with the divine spirit and to mediate the presence and rule of God in creation. Now there's a lot we could say about that, but there's only one thing I'm gonna say now, or rather I will invite Eric Raytan and John Cronin to make it for me. This is a quote from them. All creatures participate in God's goodness, especially rational creatures who are made in God's image. The rational creature is essentially a being bearing the divine image and ordered toward union with God. God can no more cease to value rational creatures, even if they fall into sin, than he can cease to value himself, because rational creatures are a reflection of his own essence. Therefore, he is always faithful to them, even when they are unfaithful to him, and he must seek to destroy their sin. To hate creatures made in his own image, even fallen ones, would be an indirect form of self-hatred, and this God cannot do. As Jürgen Moltmann notes, God is angered by human sin, not although he loves human beings, but because he loves them. He says no to sin because he says yes to the sinner. Much of the Bible concerns God's particular love for the people of Israel, and in my second talk, I'm gonna look at that a little bit closer. In Genesis 12, God picks out a childish old man, Abram, and, his, and uh, promises him descendants, a land for them to live in, and that those descendants would be a blessing for the families of the earth. Abraham, as he was later called, is chosen or elect. And the chosen line of his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's 12 sons and their descendants, the nation of Israel, share in God's election of Abraham. Israel is, we might say, chosen in Abraham. And the Bible's very clear that the people of Israel are the objects of God's special electing love. And my second talk will say more about this. But there are just some features of God's love that I think we can see in Israel's story and I wanted to identify them. First of all, it is a tenacious love that will not let Israel go no matter what. In biblical terms, we would describe this as covenant love or chesed. God will be faithful to his covenant with Israel because as St. Paul said, his gifts and his callings are irrevocable. Even sinful and rebellious Israel is, in Paul's words, loved on behalf of the patriarchs. Abandoning his beloved is simply unthinkable, no matter what they do along the way. And it is God's fidelity to Israel, not Israel's fidelity to God, that provides the foundation of hope for the people. Grace rescued Israel from Egypt. Grace gave Israel the law on Mount Sinai. Grace led Israel through the wilderness to the land and grace will eventually bring Israel to its destiny. It was grace that brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. This is a love that does not pay attention to merit. It is a nevertheless kind of love. It doesn't say, I love you because you do this. It says, I love you. And even if you do that, I still love you. I love you nevertheless. I love you when you're good and when you're bad and when you're ugly. I love you when you're strong and when you're weak and when you're virtuous and when you're vicious. God does not love Israel because they are stronger or bigger or better than anyone else. They are not. If anything, they are weaker and smaller and just as good, bad, and ugly as the nations around them. He loves them irrespective of that, and God's love is tenacious. 
Second, it is a tender love that desires to bless the beloved with good things, including salvation from oppression. Here is Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved, this is God talking through Hosea, obviously. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them by their arms, but they didn't know it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws. And I bent down to them and fed them. God's love is tender. Thirdly, it is a tough love that allows the beloved to face failure, sorrow, and pain. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. God's love may be a nevertheless kind of love, but it is not a soppy love that is happy to leave us as we are. Such a love is not love at all. Love is not content to leave us curved inwards upon ourselves, broken and distorted by sin. Rather, love works for our liberation and transformation. Fourth, it is a telic love, a purposeful love aimed to bring Israel to its telos, its destiny. God leads the beloved on a journey, often a very hard journey, but the journey that leads to a glorious goal. In Romans 11, Paul describes Israel's winding journey in which many of the nation are hardened against God and temporarily cut off from the vibrant life of the vine. But he says God even uses this rebellion and its consequences to bring about his good purposes of showing mercy to the world. And in the end, the Redeemer will come from Zion and all Israel will be saved. So God's love for Israel leads them to a final glorious goal because God's love is telic. So in the story of Israel, we get some glimpses of some aspects of the love of God. So nevertheless, love that is tenacious, tender, tough, and telic. And it means that God will not abandon Israel to its chosen self-destructive path forever. For him to do that would be for him to forsake his covenant love, and this will not happen. So we're starting to get a picture of something of the form of God's love. God's final word, however, his definitive self-manifestation and revelation is Jesus himself. God's coming to us in the person of the Messiah is also part of his faithful covenant to Israel, because here the God of Israel comes to his people as one of them. And in Jesus' words, Jesus says, when I speak, you know, my words are the first, not my words, they're the words of him who sent me. And the deeds I do are the deeds of him who sent me. So if we want to see, hear what God's saying and see what God's doing, we look at Jesus. What do we see? What does God's love look like? Look like. <laughs> and I'm an editor as well. <laughs> So I, I can't help but going back and correcting my grammatical mistakes. It looks like Jesus feeding hungry people. It looks like Jesus healing sick people. It looks like Jesus forgiving people who are literally crippled by guilt. It looks like Jesus touching people that other people don't want to touch, like lepers or the woman with the flow of blood. It looks like Jesus including people who have been excluded, like tax collectors and prostitutes and sinners. It looks like Jesus taking lowly people and elevating them, like in that society, women and children and the poor. It looks like Jesus bending low to wash his disciples' feet, it looks also like Jesus rebuking those who oppress others, and it looks like Jesus challenging people to see things differently and to live differently. All of this shows us something of what God's love is like. But it doesn't give us a neat definition of the love of God. What it does is it gives us an instinct for it, a feel, a sense of it. We can start to intuit when we're seeing it and when someone's making bogus claims about it. But the core revelation of the nature of divine love, which has already been made clear today in various talks, is the cross. Saint Paul never speaks about the love of Jesus 
without in the same breath speaking about the cross because the cross is the definitive manifestation of Christ's love and the definitive revelation of God's love. To take one example only, Romans 5. One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one might dare to die. But God showed his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The cross makes for a revolution in the Christian understanding of God's love, so much so that the cross comes to define for us the very contour lines of divine love. God's love is cross-shaped, or what Brad called cruciform. Here is love, vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood, when the prince of life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. At Calvary, we see that God's love is a humble love that sets aside its own interests for the sake of others. It is a servant love. It is a sacrificial love. It is a love that will go to the ends of the earth, indeed into the depths of hell and death itself, in order to rescue the objects of its love. And what does the resurrection tell us about God's love? It tells us that God's love does not simply stand alongside us in our plight, but delivers us from our plight. It tells us that love wins and that love will not allow sin and death and suffering to have the last word. God will not allow his Holy One to see decay. So God raises Jesus, our representative, from the dead on our behalf. And this is an act of love. It is an act of love for the Father, for, for the Son, but it is also an act of the Father's love for the world in his Son. Resurrection reveals a divine love that does not leave us as we are, but transforms us and raises us up to live a new kind of life. <clears throat> what about the final victory of God? Often theologians talk about the four last things, Christ's return, judgment, heaven and hell. He says, holding up five fingers. <laughs> but in the end, we should speak of the last one, Christ. Because the risen Lord is the future of creation. <clears throat> All things in heaven and on earth will be united under one head in Christ. That's Ephesians 1. The life of the new creation is the risen life of Christ. It is the life of the Spirit. It is the life of God. When all things are in submission to Jesus, then God will be all in all. This future isn't about last things. It's about the last one. And the last one is the God who is love revealed in Christ. Love will be all in all. It's all about Jesus. When we consider <clears throat> the shape of the new creation, we look to Christ. What does the future look like? It looks like Jesus. It looks like resurrection. It looks like love. All Christians agree that in the end, God wins the final victory, but the nature of that victory is often pictured as follows. All those who accept Jesus before they die will enter into eternal life and experience the wonderful blessings of eternity. All those who do not will be forced to bow their knee before Jesus as defeated foes, and with their resentful hearts still cursing, will be forced to acknowledge him as Lord before they're banished to eternal destruction. God thus wins a military-style victory over the unrepentant sinners. Hurrah! Jesus kicks ass. <laughs> ass, sorry, ass. <laughs> I'm English, for goodness sake. Kicks ass. <laughs> so here is my question. What does the victory of a God of love look like? Is forcing your opponents to bow before you and publicly confess that you are the winner, even though they still loathe you, the kind of victory that God's love would aspire to? No. <laughs> The victory that the God of the gospel desires is what we see in the resurrection of Jesus, new life. God wants to see deliverance. 
changed hearts, repentance, forgiveness, and transformation. That is the kind of victory that the gospel brings. Crushing people into dust is something quite different. Whatever it is, what it ain't, is a gospel triumph. When Paul speaks in Philippians 2 of every knee bowing and every tongue confessing the lordship of Christ, he is not speaking of forced and reluctant confession, but of joyful and willing confession, which is what the Greek word he uses means. Nobody can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, and such a confession is salvific. The victory of the universal acknowledgement of Christ is a gospel victory, not a military victory. A mere military victory in which God's enemies are made to grudgingly admit that God is the boss isn't a real victory because it doesn't achieve the end that God desires in creation. God wants to restore and beautify creation. Forcing reluctant sinners to admit that he's God while still rejecting them in their hearts falls far short of God's will. If I was feeling generous, I would say, well, maybe it's a victory and it's the best that God could do in the circumstances. If I was feeling less generous and more honest, I would say it's not a divine victory at all. It's just papering over the cracks of divine failure. What does the victory of the God of love look like? It looks like the gospel, like the resurrection and ascension. Okay. Let's take a little closer look at a specific text that helps us to see something about the nature of God's love. And here I owe a huge debt to Professor Thomas Tolbert, without whom, well, he was the person through whom God brought me to this understanding of God's love and enabled me to believe that God actually loved people. So I would like to honor him for that. And his influence will be seen clearly in this. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Two thoughts. First, we see clearly here what God's love looks like. Just like Paul, the author of 1 John, defines God's love in terms of the cross. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us. In this is love. The this is the cross. In the cross, God's love is shown. Now, this is important because this text is the famous God is love passage. This is a text that tells us that the very essence, the core, the heart, the being of God is love. And what does this divine essence look like? The cross. It is interesting that in John Calvin's massive systematic biblical theological work, the Institutes of Christian Religion, a work of over 1,500 pages in translation, and with thousands of biblical quotations, the one passage that is conspicuous by its absence is 1 John 4, 8 and 16. Apparently, Calvin didn't think that the claim God is love warranted so much as a passing mention when in a detailed exploration of the doctrine of God. The problem, of course, is that the classical reformed tradition, in that tradition, God doesn't love everyone. God loves some people, the chosen, but not the rest. A.W. Pink puts this with helpful clarity. When we say that God is sovereign in the exercise of his love, we mean that he loves whom he chooses. God does not love everybody. I like, I like the guy who just says it how he sees it. <laughs> what do I say to that? God is love, I say. But some Calvinists go, hey man, you're just being too flippant there. And they've sought to respond to people who flippantly go, but God is love, in one of two ways. First they say, well yes, God is love, but God is love within the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit love each other perfectly. So God is love in God's self, even if God doesn't love his creation. So whether or not God loves none, or some, or 
all of his creatures is entirely a matter of arbitrary, divine, sovereign choice. We must not, it is said, make God conform to some rule that demands he loves everyone because that would undermine his sovereignty. The problem with this argument is that it's wrong. <laughs> sure, God is love within the Trinity. We've already made that point. However, as we've seen, it doesn't follow from that that if God then chooses to create a cosmos, he can still be love if he fails to love it. And I've already sketched the reasons, the Trinitarian reasons why that is, and I won't repeat myself. But I have an allergic reaction, and this is me, I know some people might, here might take a different view, I have an allergic reaction to elevating the divine will above divine being, elevating what God chooses above who God is. God's will is sometimes presented as sovereignly free in the sense that it can will absolutely anything at all. The problem with that approach is that it's wrong. <laughs> it's also not biblical. In scripture, there are things that God cannot do. He cannot, for instance, lie, Numbers 23. He cannot, for instance, tempt people, James 1. This is not a limitation of his sovereignty. It is an expression of his perfection. So we have to ask, whose will are we speaking of here? We are speaking of the will of the God who is love. So my question is this, what would the God who is love will? Would the God of love choose not to love his good creation? That kind of suggestion doesn't even make sense. Some argue that the situation is actually a little different. Some Calvinists, that is. God does indeed love everyone, they say, but he doesn't love them all in the same way. He loves everyone in that he bestows many goods upon them. Existence, breath, food, water, lovely views, the joys of friendship and so on. This is common grace, it's undeserved, divine love for all human beings in general. But God loves the elect with a deeper, more intense love, a love that saves them. Yet those who are not chosen for salvation can't complain about this because they don't deserve anything apart from God from God apart from damnation. And yet God shows them amazing love by granting them the innumerable blessings in this life. Furthermore, he shows them his love by offering them life in the gospel and calling them to repent. We need to add there though to qualify that generous offer is that Calvinists also say that it is utterly impossible for these people to repent and believe the gospel unless God enables them to and he chooses not to do so. <laughs> so it's not such a generous offer as it sounds. The problem with this whole approach is that it presents God as a monster. Just think about it. Here is an analogy from Jerry Walls' latest book which you can see on the stall and is available for 40% discount if you go on the website. Suppose a scientist needs some perfectly healthy 25-year-old persons for some medical experiments he wants to perform that will be extremely painful for those persons and will cause them to die an agonizing death. To get these persons, he acquires 10 children that he raises in ideal circumstances. These children have no idea of his plans for them and they are repeatedly told that the scientist loves them. He gives them the best of treatment as he raises them. They are fed delicious and nutritious food. They wear the best and most stylish clothes. They live in beautiful homes and drive new cars when they're old enough to drive. They receive the best medical care and have numerous recreational and social opportunities. In short, they have every advantage and benefit that money can buy until they're 25 years old at which time they are subjected to those painful experiments that will lead to a horrible death. Now, here is the question. This is still Jerry Walls. Could anyone say with a straight face that the scientist loved these children? It is obvious that he does not love them, despite the fact that he provides for them lavishly for the first 25 years of their lives. It is clear that he does not love them because he does not care about their true well-being or promote their ultimate flourishing. He cares only for their temporary flourishing so that he can use them for his experiments, or in the Calvinist equivalent, to show the glory of his justice by punishing them in hell forever. 
Temporal blessings, says Jerry Walls, are not nearly enough to show that God loves the unconverted if God has chosen to withhold his irresistible grace, leaving them dead in their sins and thereby consigning them to the misery of eternal damnation in hell. So it seems very difficult, this is me now, not, it seems very difficult to make the case that traditional reform theology can do justice to the claim that God is love. In fact, I would say, although traditional Calvinists do believe that God is love, the claim that God is love is incompatible with traditional Calvinism. If traditional Calvinism is true, God is not love, and you can quote me on that. But some reformed thinkers just urge us to bite the bullet and to, and to say, well, the Bible just says that God's love is radically different from ours, and it's a tough pill to swallow, sure, but you just gotta lie back and think of the kingdom. Ours is not to reason why. Fortunately, one John can help us to answer the question about whether God's being love means that God loves everyone in a salvific way. Because as we have seen, the passage defines, the passage defines the love of God as a cross-shaped love. It is a redeeming love. So in this passage, we are talking about the full throttled love that the elect know. So whom does God love in this cross-like saving way? Well, the author of 1 John tells us in chapter two, verse two, he, Jesus, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So, for whom did Jesus die? He died for the whole God-forsaking world. And whom does God love in this cruciform way? the whole rebellious and sinful world. So the claim that God is love is explained in terms of God sending his son to die for everyone. That is what God is love in 1 John means. Don't forget, elsewhere, Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Remember, John 3, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Consider also 2 Corinthians 5, God's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. Or 1 Timothy 2, this is good and pleases God our savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Or Hebrews 2, we see Jesus who suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. It seems pretty darn clear to me. To deny that God loves everyone with a saving love cannot be squared with the claim in 1 John that God is love. But does this mean then that God is not sovereignly free? Of course it doesn't. God is free to be God, and nothing outside of God can determine who God is and how God has to be in order to be God. God is self-determining, but the suggestion that God can freely choose to be something contradictory to God, like evil, something other than love, this claim is vacuous, it doesn't even mean anything. Uh, one final thought. Even if, you don't, even if you think I'm wrong about all of that, and you go, no, 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 God is sovereign and he has to be free to choose people or not, you know, God is free to hate his creatures if he wants to and reject them forever. Okay, let's go with that for a minute. To preserve God's sovereignty, you'd still have to agree that God doesn't have to choose to hate some of his creatures. You'd have to agree that if God is sovereign, he can choose to love all of them if he wants. So, we could still ask, what has God freely chosen to do as a matter of fact? And from the scripture, we see that God's will for humanity is already proclaimed in the gospel. God sent his son to die for all so that they may be saved. God raised Jesus from the dead as the representative of humanity. The cross and the resurrection is the revelation of God's loving covenant commitment to all humanity. So even if God could have chosen to hate some of his creatures, which as you can see is a claim I find unintelligible, as a matter of fact, God has revealed that he has instead chosen to love them. 
So you still can't be a Calvinist, can you really? Unless you're a universalist Calvinist, like Peter Sterry, who I quoted earlier. Thus, I think that the strong claims about divine love that underpin universalism are not simply a matter of modern sentimental slussy notions of love projected onto scripture. I think they arise precisely from the Bible. When you look at the notion of God's love as it is presented across the Bible, it looks very much like the kind of love that wants to bring about the best for the objects of its love. And that kind of love is pretty hard to reconcile with traditional views of hell. What time do I finish? I can't remember. Five minutes. Five minutes. So let's skip that section. Let me just quote you. So I have a little bit on... Oh, I can cut it, don't worry. <laughs> so the second objection, you know, God is love, but so, and Brad's already spoken about that. Um, I think the instinct behind the idea that God is love, but, uh, is a good instinct. It's a desire to try and do justice to the full revelation of God in scripture. The danger is that it ends up fragmenting God. Um, what I do wanna do is just make one simple point. We do well to reflect briefly on the relationship of love to the divine attributes. It's, it's much too big for me to say anything much about now. I just want to present one principle that I think further reflection on the issue ought to adhere to. And that principle was put beautifully by my other favorite Puritan, Jeremiah White. Love is more than an attribute. It is the very name of God. It is God himself. An attribute is an imperfect and partial expression of God to us, but love is the full expression of him. So far as God can be expressed and conceived by us, God is love, and therefore all his attributes are the attributes of love. Love, in other words, isn't just another divine attribute to add to a list of things, you know, like a checklist. Oh, and by the way, he's also love. Love is God's name, it is the very core of divine being, it is the whole of God, and the attributes are various partial glimpses of this love from different angles and in different modes. Here is Peter Sterry again. If God be love, the attributes of God are the attributes of this love. The purity, the simplicity, the sovereignty, the wisdom, the almightiness, the unchangeableness, the infiniteness, the eternity, of divine love. If God be love, his work is the work of love, of a love unmixed, unconfined, supreme, infinite in wisdom and power. See, these Puritans, they were good. When they were being universalists, they were great. <laughs> So God's holiness is a manifestation of his love as is his justice and, and even his wrath. So um, Jeremiah White says, and I think this is a very helpful warning, let us fear to set up a wisdom, a power, a justice, a holiness, a greatness in God without love, without love as its ground, its root, its essence, its design, its fruit, its image, its end. When I say that God is love and the response is, yeah, he is, but he's also, I kind of, ah, <laughs> wince. God is not love, but. God is love. There are no buts. So whatever we want to say about God's wrath and whatever we want to say about hell, it has to be compatible with God's love for the object of wrath and the inhabitants of hell. If you have a theology of hell that is incompatible with the God of love, then no matter how amazing its theological pedigree, even if Augustine or Anselm or Aquinas or anybody else whose name starts with A teaches it, it is not an integrally Christian doctrine of hell. We need a doctrine of hell compatible with the God of the gospel. Let me make one final closing point. Yeah. I want to close with a thought about uh, one of the theologians whose name begins with A, Saint Anselm. He was the Archbishop of Canterbury from 1093 to 1109. So anyone who's the Archbishop of Canterbury has got to be pretty okay. In his Proslogion, he famously wrote that God is that than which nothing greater can be conceived. This is not a definition of God or anything so crass as that. But it does make an important point, I think, that whatever God is, you can't imagine anything greater. 
God will always exceed the greatest that your feeble mind can imagine. So, take a conception of God. If you can imagine something greater than this particular conception of God, then either the conception is faulty or there's something wrong with your imagination. And then intuition seems to be right to me. So if there is one problem with the classical reform view of God, a view which is taught today by many very godly and pious folk for whom I have a high regard, the problem is this, that it's quite easy to imagine a God greater than the one in their theology. According to them, God loves some people with a deep, redemptive and covenantal love, a love that never wavers or fails. While other people, he loves with a gracious and unmerited but limited love, a love that could have been a lot deeper, wider, higher and stronger than it is. But I can imagine a God greater than that one. I can imagine a God whose essence is love and who loves all his creatures with the fullness of his being, all the way to hell and back. A God whose love will not allow creation to fall short of its destiny in Christ. And that is the God I see revealed in the gospel. And that is the God that I believe holds us, all of us, in the palm of his hands. Thank you.